Hello, I'm Steve Nash. I'm a history professor at East Tennessee State University. I'm also the president of the Mountain History and Culture Group, a support board for the Zebulon Vance Birthplace State Historic Site in Weaverville, North Carolina. It's in that capacity that I am bringing to you another episode of our web series, Quarantined Historians Maybe or Maybe Not Drinking Coffee. And in this time of national unrest, as America continues to wrestle with its original historical sin of slavery and racial discrimination, as well as a continued pandemic, it is only natural that we would turn and look to history to help to understand the moment in which we now live. And with that in mind, I am pleased to be joined today by Associate Professor of History at the University of North Carolina Asheville, Darren Waters. Darren has done extensive research on the history of Black Asheville and knows as much as anybody about the roots of Black Asheville. Joined by uh, historian Darren Waters of the University of North Carolina Asheville, um, a Buncombe County and Asheville native, right? Darren, you grew up Yeah, right? un un unusual, right? <laughs> yeah, unusual. I, I am not a Buncombe County uh, or Asheville native. Um, yeah, I, I find out more and more, Steve, that uh, I'm a rare, I'm a rare uh, commodity in, in Western North Carolina, especially uh -huh. as an African-American. Yeah. I think that that's across the board because, um, I mean, especially in in Asheville and Buncombe County, because yep. uh, so many transplants there. That's right, and uh, in some ways, that's a very southern story of the 20th and 21st century too. Is, mm -hmm. As I remember going as a graduate student to Georgia, where everybody is like, you know, Atlanta is 90 percent not from Atlanta. You're right. <laughs> You're right. So I say the same about Charlotte. But anyway, it's, it's a real pleasure uh, to be here talking to you. Um, I mean, we have these conversations all the time, so now we actually get to put it on, put it on recording. Uh, help my memory as I get older. Okay. Um, but you are a uh, historian of 19th century uh, America and uh, into the 20th century America, and is specifically focused on uh, the African American experience uh, in sort of Buncombe County and Asheville. So. With that in mind, I think this is a moment where a lot of people are looking for the history of this area during uh, one of the most important transition periods in America's history. Mm -hmm. So I'd really like to sort of take the opportunity to talk to you about um, African-American institution and community building that comes mm -hmm. after emancipation. So I think that that's a good place a good place to begin, which is just to talk about African American community building in Asheville and Buncombe County, and what were some of the communities that were built um, after uh, emancipation the during the way, 19th after century? The Civil War was over. Yeah. Well, Steve, I, I guess one way that I would begin is, you know, talk a little bit about uh, my own my own research because I, finishing my PhD at Chapel Hill. I decided to focus on the development of the African-American community here in Asheville and Buncombe County in many ways because I had some personal questions of my own. Mm -hmm. you know, having grown up here, you know, I left uh, in 1985 and, I, and people know this when anyone who's heard my story knows that when I left that I left with no intention of coming back to live. You know, I have a large family, so I was coming back and forth uh, to the area to visit my and, and siblings and other members of my family. But I spent most of my adult life uh, up to this point living in eastern North Carolina in the state capital. Mm -hmm. But after deciding to go to graduate school um, and I was trying to select a dissertation topic to work on, I had already gone curious about the lack of um, a visible African-American presence in Asheville. You did, you did not see, if you came to the city, and especially in, in, during the late 1980s and 90s, Asheville did not look quite like it does today. I mean, it was there was not a lot of activity that was going on in a downtown area. Um, you had, you know, as far as the African-American community, one African-American community there was concerned. It had been really displaced because of urban renewal in the late 1960s and 1960s. So one of the communities that I grew up um, was a community named Shiloh, um, mm -hmm. in, which is South Asheville, um, not very far from the Biltmore Estate. I grew, I was born and raised, grew up in that community, 
And it was a community, while we don't know the, I don't know the specifics of when the community was founded, but uh -huh. it was founded right after the Civil War was over and was initially founded on property, established on property that eventually became the Biltmore State. Uh -huh. So if you go, up, if people go up to Biltmore State today, they'll, they'll see that they have, uh, they've identified where the, commu the community first was. And um, you can get a little bit of the backstory about uh, why the community was later moved. It was in an agreement with George Vanderbilt, which um, is curious because when I grew up, uh, as I was growing up, I was always told that African-Americans owned all of what Biltmore Estate came to be, which was right. more than 125,000 acres of land. Right. So, you know, I, it, the older I got, I was thinking there's no way that African-Americans owned all of this land. And it was owned by multiple people because, mm -hmm. you know, it goes to Transylvania County um, and Henderson County as well. But the Shiloh community was initially on that on the Biltmore State, not too far from where the house was eventually, Biltmore House was eventually built. And so then it was moved in an agreement with uh, George Vanderbilt when he bought the property to its current location, which is to, it would be to the east of Biltmore, of Biltmore Estate, uh, mm -hmm. our Biltmore Forest, which is um, a community that was developed as a part of the property that Biltmore Estate um, was on. So that was the community where I grew up. And so if you go there now, I mean, still a largely African-American community um, that is going through gentrification, just like many other communities in, throughout the country are, are experiencing this. It was one of the communities. Another community in uh, West Asheville called the Burton Street community. Mm -hmm. uh, my father grew up in the Shiloh community. I eventually grew up in the Shiloh community. My mother grew up in the Burton Street community in West Asheville. Mm -hmm. which was founded by a man named uh, E.W. Pearson. And there's a whole lot of research that's been done on Mr. Pearson. Um, he still has family that resides in the, uh, in the Burton Street community to this day. So you had Shiloh, you had Burton Street, you had the East End community, which is right in the heart of Asheville, in downtown Asheville. And you, you ask about institutions that uh, mm -hmm. were built to support support community. The YMI is mm -hmm. people who've been there. The Young Men's Institute is an institution that was there that was built to support the African-American community. Mm -hmm. The East End community is also a community that uh, Thomas Wolfe writes a lot about. Mm -hmm. People have read uh, Look Homeward Angel. You know, he talked to this particular community in Look Homeward Angel because I think as a young child, as a young boy, he sold newspapers in that community. And then um, he, in 1921, when he published this play, Welcome to Our City, it, it essentially focuses on that American East End community. So you had East, the East End, Shiloh, Burton Street. You had another town, uh, another small community, uh, which is in the Hill Street area, which would be to the north of Asheville that was known as Stumptown. Mm -hmm. um, it was another African-American community. And then there was another uh, to a little bit to the south, to the south and to the west, which was known as the South Side community. And at one point, right after the Civil War, many people referred to it as the Livingston community, mm -hmm. um, which is where my grandfather, um, Isaiah Rice, actually grew up in that community. But one of the things I always found curious about Asheville, Steve, mm -hmm as I was studying it and having lived in places like Raleigh, uh, lived for a time in Washington, D.C., you can, if you ask people where the African-American community is, it normally is one contiguous community. Um, mm -hmm. In Raleigh, it would be Southeast Raleigh, uh, mm -hmm. where the African-American communities were. Asheville was not like that. So you had these, these communities that were kind of split up uh, right. geographically from each other. So right. that was an interesting thing for me to discover and to think and, and, and to look at how it impacted the identity of African Americans in this period. But that gives you a little bit of sense of those communities that developed after the Civil War was over. Why do you think they were kind of split up like that? You know, it's, Steve, you, that's a question I've never really, I've yeah. never really thought about. Um, I, you know, I just think it had a lot to do with, you know, people, these were not necessarily, the people who founded many of these communities were not necessarily people who were originally from Asheville. 
Uh -huh. They came from other places. Um, Henderson County, there was a community called the Kingdom of the Happy Land, which I'm, heard, I'm sure that you've heard about. But this was a group of people who came from the Deep South, from Mississippi, uh -huh. Alabama, and uh -huh. a number of people who joined them as they were moving up through the Deep South into North Carolina. They had heard uh -huh. that, that the, West, the Western North Carolina and North Carolina mountains were, was a good place to actually build a community. Uh -huh. And I think that was the same with a lot of the communities that developed as well. If you look at some of the people who were the principal leaders in those communities, they were always people who had come from outside. And I think that that had a lot to do with where these communities kind of developed. Right, that's interesting. That I had never really thought about it, and it's, it's sort of talking about, and we've talked about before, right? Sometimes yeah. I, I feel like I, I, I'm guilty of a little bit of a flyover mentality because I study so many different counties in my in my work that I don't get to zero in on in particular communities. You're right. The, the, right. Thinking about the the landscape and where they're all related, um, and the people coming in from outside. So, what are some of the institutions? Uh, the sort of key institutions built by Black Ashbillians um, during this period um, and maybe some of the major figures associated with them? Well, obviously, you know, and especially from your work, um, this would just be in, in a lot of ways kind of uh, repeating some of the things that you found in your own research looking at Western North Carolina. One of the main institutions that was important to community building in African-American communities was the church. Uh -huh. So you look at the churches first, and in Asheville proper, there are, I think, seven historic African-American churches that are there, that many of those churches grew out of, uh, of white institutions uh -huh. uh, in the Civil War period, post-emancipation period, African-Americans in the effort to kind of assert their own independence, moved uh -huh. out of those white institutions and built their own uh, in church uh, institutions. Mm -hmm. and one of the first would be St. Matthias, which is Episcopal Church, which is uh, near the East End community in uh, the East in East Asheville, um, right in downtown. So you mm -hmm. have uh, St. James, which was uh, AME Hopkins Chapel, which is another AM, uh, Zion Church, AME Zion Church. Uh, Baptist Church would be Nazareth Baptist Church was the first um, African American Baptist Church to kind of develop in uh, in the Asheville uh, in the city of Asheville. You have Calvary Presbyterian Church, uh, which and all of these institutions still exist. And then you have Mount Zion, Mount Zion, which is located right in downtown as well. Um, still historic structure that is there was one of the important uh, players um, for African-Americans as far as churches were concerned. Mm -hmm. the Shiloh, I mentioned seven because in the Shiloh community, the church that uh, th there was Shiloh uh, African Method AME Church as well, which was originally on the, the Biltmore State and then was moved to the Shiloh community where it is. So if you're looking at Historic churches, those would be the seven that I would point to as uh, being very important, helping to kind of uh, build th those communities. Another major institution that was important to African-Americans, which I already mentioned, was the Young Men's Institute, which is now known as the YMI Cultural Center, mm -hmm. um, an organization that was founded in 1892. It opened its doors in 1893 with the support of George Vanderbilt. It was uh -huh. a building that is still located downtown, historic building for the YMI, was originally funded by George Vanderbilt. He funded the institution for the first 13 years of its life. Uh -huh. I mean, it's a major piece of the dissertation that I wrote, um, I published an essay on this in the North Carolina Historic Review about a year and a half ago, looking uh -huh. at the history of the YMI. Uh -huh. a, key figure, a key figure, in helping to establish, well, two two key figures that I would point to in helping to establish that institution was um, Edward Stevens, who was, an, again, a transplant to Asheville, uh -huh. was originally from here. Edward Stevens was originally uh, West Indies to the United States um, and was a teacher in St. Louis before he came to Asheville. Uh -huh. um, was supposedly, but I haven't been able to confirm the, uh, 
uh, to confirm this, but he was reported to have uh, been educated at Oxford in England. And in fact, when he came here, there was a story that was done on him in 1888 in the Asheville uh, newspaper. And it talked about uh, the fact that he spoke five languages fluently and then spoke with a slight French accent when he talked. <laughs> Right. He was a key, he was a key figure in helping to develop not only the the YMI the Young Men's Institute, but also was brought here to help um, to help build the public school system for African Americans in the late nineteen eight in the late eighteen eighties. Uh, yeah, mm-hmm. eighteen eighty. Trying to get my dates right here. So um, this would be one. I. Is another figure that you'll hear his name a lot here. Uh-huh. In fact, uh, there's a, a school, an elementary school named for Isaac Dixon, and was also one of the primary uh, figures who helped to establish the African American school system in Asheville in the late 1880s. He was a prominent businessman, uh, had small businesses. Um, in that downtown area, I think he operated two or three businesses in that uh-huh. area but helped found the uh, YMI as, uh, as well. Mm-hmm. He was a member of the first church that I, that I mentioned and helped to, um, to found that church, which was St. Matthias. Uh, he was another figure. Another major figure that you will hear as far as African-American history in this region is in the city of Asheville in particular is uh, Vester, James Vester Miller, who mm-hmm. was a builder. And a number of the, the buildings um, in uh, downtown Asheville, um, in fact, people come to town now, the, uh, was the, the municipal building, which is where the, the current police department and the fire department housed, was uh-huh. built by James Bester Miller, as is the, the one church that I mentioned, um, Zion Baptist Church, uh-huh. beautiful structure, as I said. He was also the builder of that of that building as well. But those are some of the figures who were key players here. There are right. a number of others that we could talk about. But right. I know we don't have time to talk about all sure. of these names. Sure. Yeah. And, and it speaks to, you know, talking about Asheville as sort of um, um, the number of outsiders coming into Asheville, right? It, it, it's worth pointing out and, um, for people who are watching this who are, you know, perhaps not as – steeped in and up to our eyebrows as you and I are in studying Asheville, right? That uh, mm-hmm. Asheville was the sort of major economic hub for the region. It was. So it drew a bunch of people because uh, Dixon also was not originally not from, here. from here. No, he right? was not. I think yeah. originally from, um, neither neither was James Vester Miller. I think, right. uh, you know, I'm trying, I think if, I, if I'm correct here, um, Steve, Dixon may have been from Rutherford County, right? And I think Miller, uh, James Vester Miller, was from Rutherford County as well. Right. Um, name that we hadn't mentioned here would be uh, James Leatherwood. I think that uh-huh. name you've probably heard. Uh-huh. Um, who um, had a newspaper, an African American newspaper. I think it was called the Colored Enterprise. Um, which uh-huh. you know, I guess when they they opened up the time capsule that was underneath the Vance Monument that right. was a copy of that paper. I think the only known copy uh, right. that I know yeah. of this, this newspaper. Yeah. But Leatherwood, who opened uh, the first uh, black pharmacy, a pharmacy for African Americans, and operated it out of the YMI building for years, right. came from Haywood County. He and his brother came from Haywood County. Right. So actually, and you and you know, studying this period, that W. E. B. Du Bois talks about how, in in the post Civil War, post Emancipation period, I mean, many African Americans wanted to come to the city. Is moving away from these rural spaces because a lot of a lot felt that uh, the countryside was associated with with uh, with slavery, right. and a way to kind of distance yourself from that existence was to move to urban spaces. Right. And in West North Carolina, it just so happened that Asheville was that was that space. Right, which has really always been sort of fascinating to me. And uh, I once told John Insko that I was going to try to write a article about sort of the rise of Asheville as an urban place. And, and he kind of laughed at me <laughs> because I was going to try to make the argument that, you know, sort of Asheville became urban during Reconstruction. And he just kind of laughed at me. And, and part of the reason why I realized he kind of laughed at me is I think to this day – 
the United States Census Bureau defines an urban space as a population of 2,500 people or more, which is a, to us, a seemingly throwaway small number. I mean, I, I, I use this number to my students all the time, and I ask them, like, how many of you went to a high school with 2,500 people or more? And about half of them went to a high school. So I'm like, on a day-to-day -day basis, your high school was an urban place. Uh, but... You know, so, Asheville so, doesn't, Steve, you, you have to tell me. So what was John's take on this about Asheville well, as an urban space? Asheville was not urban, was, okay. his, was his sort of response, was that, you know, for all this sort of, and, and you know, I think his, his take was, you know, numerically, it just doesn't fit because the population mm -hmm. doesn't cross 2,500, I don't think, until after the railroad arrives. That's right, right, that's right, that's right. So Asheville remains below 2,500 people in, in residence for, you know, a good 15 years after the Civil War. Mm -hmm. So what I was going to try to argue was that it had to deal with uh, services and uh, it had to deal with an employment and it had to deal with community building and the idea that, you know, reconstruction and, and the end of slavery created these possibilities uh, or, you know, service providing that urban spaces offer. Um, and, you know, John was good natured enough that he, he heard me out, but he was skeptical. And to be clear, uh, up until this point, I have not actually completed that. So John may still be right. Okay. Uh, he, he may still be right. It might, it might not be doable, but um, I'm, definitely, I'm definitely thinking about it still. But, you know, the stuff that you're describing, you know, the sort of development, the pharmacies, the businesses, all these sorts of things are connected. And obviously to people in Western North Carolina, Asheville was even if the Census Bureau wouldn't call it urban, it was the urban space. This That's was the right. place to get. That's right. It was. It was the, it, it, I think it would be hard to argue that as far as the entire region of Western North Carolina was concerned, it was considered the economic, cultural, and, and political kind of um, mm -hmm. center of, of the region. And that gets it, you know, uh, Ashevillians like to promote that um, with a sense of pride. I think people in the more rural spaces of Western North Carolina, look at Asheville kind of with this, uh, with this, with, with a sense of suspicion because mm -hmm. of that, you know, yeah. <laughs> even to this day, you know. Yeah. No, and, I, you I, about, and you think about, Steve, so much of the work that has been, that has been done on the transform, the transformation of, of, even small villages and towns. I mean, Edward Ayers talks about this in his book, The Promise of the New South. Mm -hmm. and how small spaces really are, even though they would be seen as small villages or small towns, they, they really begin to transform. I think not just after the war is over, but while the war is in progress, because Asheville has, it, it had the armory. The armory was there, right, for mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, for the Confederate Army, it was located in all of these different pieces uh, that it actually hosted. I mean, was giving it that sense and that feel that it would become this kind of major urban space. If that makes sense, it would. Yeah, it does. Urban. And, and I, you know, the thing that has always been so frustrating to me about Asheville as well is population numbers. First of all, we don't have real good concrete population numbers for Asheville proper. Um, in the thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> but, but the, you know, Asheville has been a tourist destination mm -hmm. almost from the get-go. And uh, the population numbers, even if we had good ones, would be misleading because the amount of people who were here, mm -hmm. for, yeah, for long stretches of time, you know, this is, this is one of those things for particular for people like me who perhaps are interested in, you know, scholars who are interested in uh, knowing how much the, uh, black population of Asheville, of Asheville actually was immediately impacted by emancipation. I can't tell people, and even then I think part of it is misleading because so many uh, um, tourists were enslavers coming up out of the deep south, places like South Carolina and Georgia, yeah, that for huge good. stretches of the year, the black population of Asheville was actually probably much higher than what it might be recorded as, but... Mm -hmm. You know, you had this sort of influx and outflux of population each each season. Um, right. And then, I, I mean, we know that it grew uh, significantly from 1860 to 1870. And obviously, a lot of that probably has to do with people coming in after emancipation.
Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, again, how much that actually, I, I, I would, I would love to have, you know, concrete numbers. And there's a historian, there's a historian who uh, studied Montgomery County, Virginia, which is where uh, Blacksburg is. And the Freedmen's Bureau agent Montgomery County, uh, you know, <laughs> God bless him, did a census of the population in 1865, 1866. So we actually, you know, you he has those numbers. numbers. Yeah. Right. So he actually could tell and how many people had come in from someplace else or whatever. I, if that exists for Asheville, I've never seen it. Yeah, I've never seen it either. I wish that it did. So yeah. you, you know, when you're writing about this, you kind of have to, you, you get into uh, uh, the problem of conflating the city's numbers with the county's numbers. Right. So it's really, it is really difficult to kind of uh, right. pull, to pull those two numbers apart. Yeah. Right. You know, what sort of work uh, opportunities existed uh, for African-Americans in Asheville and Buncombe County from say well, you know, it, on. Yeah, so you know, see you already you touched upon um the fact that Asheville has all always been kind of this tourism hub. I mean, Western North Carolina, Hendersonville, you know, Flat Rock, all of those places, you know, there are a number of people who traveled through the region in the during the antebellum period who write about, you know, what what some of um the uh, hotels are inns like in staying in these places. So what is interesting is that the, the fact that it was a tourism hub, it actually provided opportunities for African Americans economically um, that may not may not have existed in other places to art that we might be, be surprised to know that those opportunities existed. Because during the time, you know, most service related work was performed by African Americans. Right. right. So when the, as the tourism economy are, uh, it, are the tourism industry in Asheville and in other parts of Western North Carolina expanded, it, it, it increased those opportunities for African Americans. But in talking about tourism, in the post-Civil War and post-emancipation period, as you know, uh -huh. the, early, the, early, um, the early industry that, that tourism kind of built was also the health resort uh, or the healthcare industry because this was also in, in the early stages it was really that kind of healthcare component that the region was was known to be a, a great place for especially people who had lung ailments tuberculosis would become the big the, the big thing uh, here in uh, in Asheville and Western North Carolina uh, later on, but eventually there would be a move away from that to build a more kind of leisurely tourism industry uh, just for people's uh, enjoyment. And African Americans would benefit from the fact that the service sector would offer them jobs. So they're performing jobs like the uh, chambermaids are working as waiters and sometimes even cooks in the hotels. We have mm -hmm. stories of people who work even prior to uh before the civil war who worked as um as guides taking tourists on guides throughout the region um so slavery it it, it meant that slavery kind of looked uh very different here in some respects than it did in other places there was a, a great deal of independence that uh african americans that some americans tended to um to enjoy that wasn't the case in other places where plantation slavery was more dominant. Right. The plantation economy was more dominant. But for, for a long time, even into the early 20th century, African Americans were dominating the service sector of the, uh, of the tourism industry. It's odd that you don't really see that now. Um, mm -hmm. In that early period, that was where you would find most African Americans working in that industry. Now, as far as the professional class is concerned, you know, for black professionals, it was all, and you know, ministers were considered a part of that uh, black professional class. Um, you would have uh, teachers, teachers uh -huh. in the um, in the in the uh, in the segregated school system were a part of the black professional class. You did have some independent business owners. Uh -huh. You know, we talked about Isaac Dixon early, uh -huh. uh, early on. Uh, Thomas Leatherwood, I think I called him James Leather, Leatherwood earlier, but it was Thomas Leatherwood was his name. Thomas Leatherwood was also an independent businessman owning um, 
a, a dry goods uh, shop here before he opened up the uh, pharmacy that he eventually operated out of the YMI. In my research, I discovered that there were a lot of African Americans who had kind of their own independent eating establishments, especially <laughs> in that um, in that East End community. So there was there were a lot of that. Another uh, group that you would find in that professional class would be people um, would be uh, morticians, people who <laughs> owned funeral homes. So you had at least in the late nineteenth century, you had about three funeral home operators here. Asheville is interesting, too, because African-Americans, as far as the service sector is concerned, they continue to dominate uh, businesses like barbering, like the barber barber shops. Um, mm -hmm. There were very few white barbers in, uh, in Asheville in the late 19th century. So that was another area where you found African-Americans able to find employment and actually make, make, pretty, uh, make off pretty well uh, mm -hmm. economically. Uh, in those in those businesses, you had at least two black uh, two African American doctors in the late nineteenth century who were here, um, and so this provided another area of uh, professionalization uh, where uh, you would find some African Americans. Uh, largely, Steve, it would be in that um, in the service sector of the tourism industry where you would find African Americans. Right. Yeah. No, that's. Uh... That's interesting. That's always, you know, that's always been one of the parts of your work that I've mm -hmm. found the most helpful and compelling. And I know that we've talked about this sometimes in the past, you know, like sometimes feeling like where I sort of come up to and then where you pick up right, right. connections between those, I, I always sort of find interesting because I, I feel like sometimes mm -hmm. I'm the reconstruction guy um, and, it, and it's hard to make reconstruction po sound positive uh, to a lot of people. Um, and, and I mean, it, we've talked about it before and you, you're fond of mm -hmm. quoting, I think John Hope Franklin, which is great, right? The splendid <laughs> failure. That's right. That's right. That, that's, that's what it was. And that's how it sort of, you know, that's how you can make it positive. Mm -hmm. But, you know, a lot of the transitions that I see after the war, um, <laughs> in terms of labor and then the way you pick it up, I've always found really fascinating. And, and let me just say here, you know, as you mentioned your work, I feel the need to do this. Um, since this is being recorded, I benefited, <laughs> I benefited greatly. I pause. <laughs> I, I might pause. <laughs> I benefited greatly from your work, Steve. Thank you. <laughs> uh, well, I, I, you know, I'm going to repay the favor.